Hi listeners, welcome to the Classic Audiobooks channel. Here we represents the early Indian last part, written by Tony Joseph. The Last Migrants, The Aryans, How a Band of Warriors and Pastoralists from the Steppe First Dominated Europe and then South Asia, giving India its largest family of languages, new religious customs and a cultural mix that combined Harappan traditions and steppe practices. There is no question in Indian prehistory that has caused more heat and dust than this one. When and how did Indo-European language speakers, who called themselves Aryans, reach the Indian subcontinent? This is curious because no similar and extreme controversy surrounds questions like, when did the first inhabitants reach India? Or, when did Dravidian language speakers reach India? Or, when did the Mundari, Khasi or Meiti language speakers reach India? It provokes no one's ire when it is said that the original inhabitants of India came from Africa. That Proto-Dravidian is related to the Elamitic language of Iran. Or that Mundari, Khasi and Meiti speakers came from East Asia. All of this is taken with a shrug because, after all, there is no nation in the world today that has not been shaped by repeated mass migrations. Europe has seen its demography upturned at least two times through mass migrations, the Americas saw at least three major migrations that shaped their demography and these were even before the first European set foot there. East Asia has seen at least three major migrations, while Central Asia and West Asia have been the sites of so many invasions and migrations that it is difficult to keep count. And it is not as if Indians have not ventured out and influenced other regions massively either, especially in the early centuries of the Common Era. All of Southeast Asia, from today's Vietnam and Cambodia to Burma, Thailand and Indonesia, once fell within the ambit of India's cultural preeminence. Even China came under the spell of India for a while. Occasionally this may have involved invasion, but more often it involved the ceaseless efforts of Buddhist missionaries keen to spread their religion, and very often it had to do with merchants out to make a profit and protect and further their interests, that Buddhism has 488 million adherents around the world, with only a minority of them in India today, is testimony to the impact India made outside of its natural boundaries. So what accounts for this special sensitivity to the question about the arrival of Indo-European language speakers? The answer is simple, it is the unstated but underlying assumption that Indian culture is identical or synonymous with Aryan, Sanskrit, or Vedic culture. Therefore, to ask when Indo-European languages reached India would be seen to be the same as asking, when did we import our culture? But this is ridiculous on two counts. First of all, Indian culture is not synonymous with, or identical to, Aryan, or, Sanskrit, or, Vedic culture. Aryan culture was an important stream that contributed to creating the unique Indian civilization as we know it today, but by no means was it the only one. There were other streams that have contributed equally to making Indian civilization what it is. Second, to say that Indo-European languages reached India at a particular historical juncture is not the same as suggesting that the Vedas or Sanskrit or the Aryan culture was imported flat-packed and then reassembled here. Aryan culture was most likely the result of interaction, adoption and adaptation among those who brought Indo-European languages to India and those who were already well-settled inhabitants of the region. So to come back to the question, did Indo-European language speakers who called themselves Aryans, come from elsewhere, and if they did, when did they do so? Out of India as out of the reckoning until recently, there was some room for debate on the question whether the spread of Indo-European languages around the world could be explained by people moving out of India with an early version of Sanskrit rather than people moving into India with an early version of Sanskrit. But genetic studies, especially those based on ancient DNA, are rapidly closing the door on that debate. Here is how they are doing it. About three quarters of Indians today speak an Indo-European language such as Hindi, Gujarati, Bengali, Punjabi or Marathi. So does about 40% of the world, with Spanish, English, French, Portuguese, Iranian, Russian and German being some of the other widely spoken Indo-European languages. The Indian subcontinent forms the easternmost limit of the Indo-European language family range, there being no large populations speaking any Indo-European languages to our east. So the natural question arises, how did this language family become the dominant language in India, 
There are only two possible answers. Either it came to India from the outside sometime in the past, or it went from India to the rest of the world that is west of it. Let us consider the second possibility first, that a large number of Sanskrit or Proto-Sanskrit speaking Indians once ventured west and they and their descendants spread out over vast regions all the way from Iran to Central Asia to West Asia to Eastern Europe and Western Europe, thus spawning versions of Indo-European languages along the route. What would you then expect to see in the genetic record of all those regions? A fair sprinkling of the genetic signature of the first Indians, the descendants of the out-of-Africa migrants. As we saw in the previous chapters, the first migrants had spread all over the subcontinent and were part of the population that built the Harappan civilization as well. So if significant emigrations from India any time before or after the Harappan civilization were responsible for the spread of Indo-European languages, we would have to see their genetic footprints all the way from Central Asia to Western Europe. Is there such a large signature across this region? Nor on the contrary, as we saw in Chapter 1, the descendants of the first Indians have no close relatives anywhere else in the world. So the idea of an out-of-India migration that spread Indo-European languages around the world is a non-starter. There is one exception to this that proves the rule, the Roma, a relatively small itinerant ethnic group living mostly in Europe and the Americas who were earlier known as Gypsies. Genetic studies have confirmed that they come from a single ethnic group that left northwestern India, the regions of Punjab, Sindh, Rajasthan and Haryana, some 1500 years ago, long after Indo-European languages became well established in Europe and elsewhere. So as they migrated west, did they carry the typical genetic signature of the first Indians? Yes, they did. According to a study titled, Reconstructing the Indian Origin N. Dispersal of the European Roma, a Maternal Genetic Perspective, published in 2011. T. Vo different groups of lineages could be distinguished among the Roma. The European, Middle Eastern haplogroups accounted for 65% to 94% in different Roma groups, whereas the rest of the lineages belong to haplogroup M. This last haplogroup is common in East Africa and Asia, but is rarely found in Europe. Two within haplogroup M, all lineages were of clear Asian origin except one East African M1A1 sequence found in two Portuguese Roma. The main Asian subhaplogroups found were M5A1, M18 and M35B, which have been reported to have an Indian origin. In other words, when there was an emigration of people from the Indian subcontinent towards the west and all the way to Europe, a genetic signature indeed went with them, of the descendants of the first inhabitants of South Asia, the deep-rooted maternal haplogroup M, which is rarely found in Europe. Since the Romas couldn't have introduced Indo-European languages to Europe and since there is no other significant genetic South Asian signature in Europe or Central Asia, we have to consider the case for out of India as closed. This takes us to the next question, if migrations into India led to the spread of Indo-European languages in the Indian subcontinent, when did they happen, and where did the migrants come from? Genetic signature of the Aryans, this question, which has vexed scholars and animated partisans for over a century, is now being settled by genetic evidence made possible by new techniques for extracting and analyzing ancient DNA which allow us to see how people moved and how demography changed over time. By analyzing ancient DNA from the same location at different periods, or from the same period at different locations, geneticists can answer what changed when. But before exploring further the question regarding the migration of Indo-European language speakers to India, let us take a step back and answer a variant of the question that we asked while discussing the out-of-India hypothesis, if Indo-European languages are spread over a large area of Eurasia, is there a genetic signature visible across this geography? Yes, there is, the Y chromosome haplogroup R1A or, more specifically, its subclade R1AM417, which accounts for almost all the R1A lineages in the world today. A map of R1AM417 distribution would show it extending from Scandinavia to South Asia, covering almost all of the Indo-European language-speaking world. Can we look more closely at R1AM417 and see how it is distributed around the world? Yes, we can, and this is what it shows, 
R1AM417 split into two groups, R1AZ282 and R1AZ93, around 3800 BCE, with very different distribution patterns. R1AZ282 is seen only in Europe, while R1AZ93 is seen in parts of Central Asia and South Asia and accounts for almost all the R1A lineages in India. The difference is strikingly huge. A study titled, The Phylogenetic and Geographic Structure of Y-Chromosome Haplogroup R1A published in 2014 and led authored by Dr. Peter A. Underhill, the world's best-known authority on Y-Chromosome, says, of the 1693 European R1AM417 samples, more than 96% were assigned to R1AZ282, whereas 98.4% of the 490 Central and South Asian R1A lineages belong to R1AZ93, consistent with the previously proposed trend. To recap, R1AM417 is the Y-chromosome haplogroup most closely connected with the widest range of Indo-European language-speaking regions, and its subclade R1AZ93 is what accounts for almost all of the R1A lineage in India while its brother clade R1AZ282 accounts for almost all of the R1A lineage in Europe. So do we know where in the world the earliest evidence for R1AM417? And its subclade R1AZ93 has been found? Yes, we do. The oldest R1AM417 was found in Ukraine, dated to between 5000 BCE and 3500 BCE. As reported in the paper, The Genomic History of Southeastern Europe, published in 2017. It was also discovered in Samara, Russia, dated to around 2800 BCE, and in many places in Eastern Europe, dated to around 2500 BCE. The subclade R1AZ93 common in India has been found in many Central Asian steppe samples that date to as early as 2500 BCE. In fact, during the Middle to Late Bronze Age between 2000 BCE and 1400 BCE, R1AZ93 had a frequency as high as 68% in the Central Asian steppe, according to a study discussed in detail in the next section. The inescapable conclusion, therefore, is that the R1AZ93 population in India came somewhere from the Eurasian steppe region. But how do we know that R1A and its subgroups are linked to Indo? European language speakers in India. There is an easy way to check, look at the distribution of R1A among Indian population groups and see if they are linked to the traditional custodians of the Sanskrit language, the upper castes in general or the Brahmins in particular. Many studies have repeatedly shown that there is much higher prevalence of R1A among the upper castes than the lower castes and that it is about twice as high among the Brahmins as among the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes. So what we see is a genetic signature that is prevalent among Indo-European language-speaking countries and that also has a strikingly elevated presence among the traditional custodians of the oldest layer of Indo-European languages in India, Sanskrit. Step Migrations Step by step the study that put the question of Indo-European language speakers migrating to India to rest was released as recently as on 31 March 2018, and was titled The Genomic Formation of South and Central Asia. This path-breaking work that for the first time had access to ancient DNA from South Asia, Kazakhstan and Eastern Iran, and its galaxy of eminent authors, was discussed in detail in Chapter 2, pp. 91-97. So here we will limit our recap of that study to parts that deal specifically with Aryan migration. The study says there was indeed a southward migration of pastoralists from the Kazakh steppe, first towards southern Central Asian regions, that is, present-day Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, after 2100 BCE, and then towards South Asia throughout the second millennium BCE, 2000 BCE to 1000 BCE. On their way, they impacted the Bactria Margina Archaeological Complex BMAC, a civilization that thrived between 2300 BCE and 1700 BCE, centered on the Oxus River and covering today's northern Afghanistan, southern Uzbekistan and western Tajikistan, but mostly bypassed it to move further down towards South Asia. Here they mixed with the existing people of the Harappan civilization thus creating one of the two main sources of population in India today, ancestral North Indians, 
or Ani, the other being ancestral South Indians, or Asi, who were formed by the mixing of the people of the Harappan civilization with the first Indians in southern India around the same time. The study arrived at these conclusions after detecting signals of the migrations in the ancient DNA. To quote, our analysis shows no evidence of steppe pastoralist ancestry in groups surrounding BMAC sites prior to 2100 BCE, but suggests that between 2100 to 1700 BCE, the BMAC communities were surrounded by peoples carrying such ancestry. This shows there was a migration of the people of the steppe to the BMAC region around 2100 BCE. Also, as mentioned earlier, among the ancient DNA from BMAC sites, as well as among the ancient DNA from the eastern Iranian site of Shah i Sokhta, the study made some surprising discoveries with major consequences. Three outlier individuals dated to between 3100 BCE and 2200 BCE, with an ancestry profile that was unique. Unlike other ancient DNA samples from the same sites, these had 14 to 42 percent ancestry from the first Indians, in addition to ancestry from Zagras agriculturists. The Harappan civilization was known to have had contacts with both the BMAC and Shah I Sokhta, so the study concluded that the outlier individuals were recent migrants from there. These individuals, like others around them, had no steppe ancestry whatsoever. This fits with the view that the steppe pastoralists started migrating southward only around 2100 BCE. But the clincher was yet to come. The scientists also had access to ancient DNA from the Swat Valley of Pakistan, dated to between 1200 BCE and 1 CE, more than a thousand years later than the Shah i Sokhtar and BMAC samples. The Swat Valley samples were genetically very similar to the three outliers from Shah i Sokhtar in the BMAC and, like them, had ancestry from the first Indians and Zagras agriculturists. But there was one crucial and telling difference, they also had steppe ancestry of about 22%. The study says, this provides direct evidence for steppe ancestry being integrated into South Asian groups in the second millennium BCE and is also consistent with the evidence of southward expansions of the steppe groups through Turan at this time. The study then notes that a great majority of the people speaking Indo-European languages in Europe and Asia today carry ancestry that is related to steppe pastoralists known as the Yamnaya, more on the Yamnaya in the next section. This is in accordance with the long-held theory that the Yamnaya spoke late Proto-Indo-European and that they spread the Indo-European languages both to Europe and to Asia. Earlier genetic studies had documented the westward movement of the Yamnaya into Europe beginning 3000 BCE, but until this study was released there was no direct ancient DNA evidence of the chain of transmission of steppe ancestry to South Asia. The authors of the study believe that their documentation of large-scale movement of steppe groups southwards in the second millennium BCE now provides this missing evidence. There's more. Remember we said the present-day Indian population is a product of the mingling between the Ni, Harappans, first Indians plus Zagras agriculturists, plus steppe pastoralists, and Asi, Harappans plus first Indians. When the geneticists tested whether the ni asi mixture model fits 140 present-day population groups in South Asia, 10 groups stood out, each of them being poor fits because they had much more than the expected levels of steppe ancestry. The strongest signals of elevated steppe ancestry were in two groups that were of traditionally priestly status, expected to be custodians of texts written in Sanskrit. What could explain this? According to the study, one possibility is that the migration of steppe pastoralists into South Asia created different groups with different proportions of steppe ancestry. And those with higher levels of steppe ancestry seem to have had a central role in sustaining or spreading early Vedic culture. Strong rules of endogamy, marrying within one's own community among some population groups may have resulted in this excess steppe ancestry persisting to this day. Who were the Yamnaya? Now that we know what happened, let us ask who exactly these steppe people were that migrated to Europe and to South Asia, spreading their language and leaving a genetic mark on such a large area of the world. The steppe is a vast region of grasslands, shrublands and savanna that extends from Central Europe to China, over an 8,000 km stretch that has historically been sparsely inhabited.
After the out-of-Africa migrants populated much of Eurasia some 50,000 to 35,000 years ago, different regions were inhabited by groups of people who were often isolated from each other by distance and by geographical barriers and who, therefore, grew genetically differentiated from each other. The people who inhabited the steppe at this time are today classified as Eastern Hunter Gatherers (EHG) of the steppe region and ancient North Eurasians AIN, of the Siberian region, who are related to the people that migrated to the Americas about 16,000 years ago, through the Bering Land Bridge. Then, starting around 5000 BCE there was an influx of people from The. Caucasus the region between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea that connects West Asia to the steppe, into the steppe, resulting in new settlements, the Yamnaya are the result of this influx, and they draw equal ancestry from the Caucasus and the hunter-gatherer population of The. Steppe. By around 3700 BCE, the Caucasus region became the center of the Maikop culture, which seems to have had a strong influence on the Yamnaya. The practice of building kurgans, burial mounds made by heaping stone and earth over a burial chamber, often made of wood, that the Yamnaya are most closely associated with is seen for the first time in the Caucasus, for instance, and it is often argued that the earliest Proto-Indo-European language could have been spoken in the Caucasus before it became the language of the Yamnaya. There were three technological innovations that the Yamnaya adapted from neighboring populations such as the Maikop that shaped their role in history the wheel, the wagon and the horse. We have been unable to zero in on where exactly the wheel was invented because no sooner was it invented than it spread across Eurasia like wildfire. Perhaps it was invented in more than one place at the same time, as we saw in chapter 3, there are clay models of the wheel in the Harappan civilization dating from before 3000 BCE. The wheel, the wagon and the horse were particularly useful for the Yamnaya because of the geography of their region. Large parts of the steppe were until then uninhabitable due to a lack of rains that made it unsuitable for agriculture, except along the river valleys, and it had far too few watering holes to maintain large flocks of sheep and cattle. But with wagons on wheels drawn by oxen or horses, the Yamnaya could take water and supplies with them into the vast steppe. These draft animals must have enabled the Yamnaya to scale their cattle herding and reap huge productivity gains. From there it would have been but a small step to start trading with cultures such as the Maikop, thereby growing in wealth and influence. That the wagons and horses were crucial to the lives of the Yamnaya is evident from the fact that they were buried with their owners, as seen in the Kurgans of the period. The new, mobile lifestyle of the Yamnaya had such an impact on the steppe that many settlements in the region were abandoned, and the only permanent structures that the Yamnaya themselves left behind wherever they went were their kurgans. In time, owing to the settled communities they traded with, the Yamnaya also mastered the art of metallurgy, a crucial skill for a world of conflict. And conflict was about to break out. The Yamnaya burst upon Europe around 3000 BCE, a thousand years before their descendants and relatives reached South Asia. In the archaeological record, this new influx into Europe was reflected by a new culture called Corded Ware that started becoming evident from around 2900 BCE. The term Corded Ware refers to a distinctive style of pottery with twisted cord impressions on them, and this culture covered a vast swathe of territory from Switzerland to European Russia. In Germany, ancient DNA showed that people who were buried with corded ware pottery drew about 75% of their ancestry from groups related to the Yamnaya and the rest from the farmers who had been the previous inhabitants of the region. The incoming Yamnaya were also responsible for spreading the bell beaker culture through much of Europe, even though it did not originate with them. Bell beaker refers to a style of distinctive pottery that includes vessels shaped like an upside-down bell. In Britain, the incoming Indo-European language-speaking people with the Bell Beaker culture more or less replaced the earlier people of the island who had built the Stonehenge. British and Irish skeletons from the Bronze Age that followed the Beaker period had at most around 10% ancestry from the first farmers of these islands, with the other 90% from people like those associated with the Bell Beaker culture in the Netherlands. This was a population replacement at least as dramatic as the one that accompanied the spread of corded ware culture, writes David Reich in Who We Are and How We Got Here.
the Lithuanian American archaeologist Marija Jimbuts, who was the first to propose the Kurgan hypothesis in the 1950s, which said that the Proto Indo European language was spoken by the people of the Kurgan burial culture in the steppe. The Yamnaya thought the influx of the Yamnaya into Europe brought about major cultural changes. She said, the process of Indo Europeanization was a cultural, not a physical transformation. It must be understood as a military victory in terms of successfully imposing a new administrative system, language and religion upon the indigenous groups. Jim Boots characterized the nature of transition from the Mediterranean cult of the mother goddess to a patriarchal society and the worship of the warlike thunderer, Zeus, Deus, as violent. Even though her Kurgan hypothesis has more or less stood the test of time, her characterization of the transition in such stark terms is contested by many who believe it was more gradual and peaceful. The migrations, in their view, were not a concerted military operation, but a gradual expansion of many different tribes and cultures, over many generations. The criticism of Jim Boots has merit. But there is a valorization of violence and a male-centeredness that is noticeable in the cultures the new migrants created, their burial mounds had mostly males, often with evidence of great wounds, and many graves contained impressive battle axes. There is also genetic evidence for the fact that the Yamnaya expansions were male-centered. According to David Reich, the Y chromosomes that the Yamnaya carried were nearly all of a few types, which shows that a limited number of males must have been extraordinarily successful in spreading their genes. In contrast, in their mitochondrial DNA, the Yamnaya had more diverse sequences. The Yamnaya expansion also cannot have been entirely friendly, as is clear from the fact that the proportion of Y chromosomes of steppe origin in both Western Europe and India today is much larger than the proportion of the rest of genome. This preponderance of male ancestry coming from the steppe implies that male descendants of the Yamnaya with political or social power were more successful at competing for local mates than local groups. Reich takes the example of Iberia in far southwestern Europe, where Yamnaya-derived ancestry arrived suddenly between 2500 BCE and 2000 BCE based on ancient DNA from this period. It was found that approximately 30% of the Iberian population was replaced with the arrival of steppe ancestry. But the replacement of Y chromosomes was much more dramatic, writes Reich, adding, in our data, around 90%. Of males who carry Yamnaya ancestry have a Y chromosome type of steppe origin that was absent in Iberia prior to that time. It is clear that there were extraordinary hierarchies and imbalances in power at work in the expansions from the steppe. Genetics cannot answer what manner of force was used to ensure that local Iberian males left few children behind in comparison to the newly arrived Yamnaya males. Were they killed, driven away or just marginalized? We do not know. Genetics can only show what the result was, the substantial elimination of the local males from the genetic pool. East, West and East again around the same time as they were pouring into Europe, the Yamnaya also sped east across the steppe to the Minusinsk Basin and the Altai Mountains in South Siberia, to create their what came to be known as the Afanasyevo culture, probably speaking an early version of Torcherian, an extinct Indo-European language. But a more crucial expansion from the South Asian perspective came after the Yamnaya went into Western Europe and created the Corded Ware culture. Genetic evidence suggests there was then an eastward reflux back beyond the Urals of Western Russia after 3000 BCE, carrying the typical Corded Ware genetic mixture of Yamnaya and European Middle Neolithic, Europe underscore MN, farmers. By around 2600 BCE, the Yamnaya had splintered into many different successor cultures from Corded Ware in Sinteshta to Shrubnayar and Andronovo across the vast steppe, each one with its own unique style and practices. A study titled Population Genomics of Bronze Age Eurasia, published in Nature in June 2015 says, from the beginning of 2000 BC, a new class of master artisans known as the Sinteshta culture emerged in the Urals, building chariots, breeding and training horses, and producing sophisticated new weapons. These innovations quickly spread across Europe and into Asia where they appeared to give rise to the Andronovo culture. Both the Sinteshta and the Andronovo cultures are of relevance to the migration of steppe people to South Asia. As documented by David W. Anthony, the American professor of anthropology who specializes in Indo-European history and languages.
adapted from Genomic Formation of South and Central Asia, BioRxiv, 2018. In 7 He Horse, The Wheel and Language, Anthony explores in detail the similarities between the rituals uncovered during excavations at the Russian archaeological sites of Sintishtar and Arkham and those described in the Rigveda, the earliest of the Vedas, variously dated to sometime between 1700 BCE and 1100 BCE, 3 though there is no unanimity on whether parts of it were composed by the Ayans before they reached India. The similarities go to buttress the argument that the Aryans, who composed the Vedas and brought Indo-European languages to India were related to the people who left behind evidence of their cultural practices in places like Sinteshtar and Akam. To quote Anthony, Anthony describes a Shrugnaya site excavated by him that contained surprising evidence of the connection between archaeological evidence in the steppe and the myths of Indians and Iranians. Point four: the evidence related to the midwinter New Year's sacrifice and initiation ceremony, held on the winter solstice, Anthony writes. Anthony says the chariot building, stronghold based chiefdoms of Sinteshtar armed themselves with new kinds of weapons, created a new style of funeral rituals that involved spectacular public displays of wealth and generosity and began to mine and produce metals on a scale previously unimagined in the steppe. Sometime around 2000 BCE, they finally broke through, or went around, the Ural Mountains and spread eastward across the steppe. He writes, with them went the eastern daughters of Sinteshtar the offspring who would later emerge into history as the Iranians and the Vedic Ayans. These eastern and southern connections finally brought northern steppe cultures into face-to-face -face contact with the old civilizations of Asia. Anthony wrote his book with the backing of archaeological data, mostly. But now, ancient DNA has shown that he was on the mark. The genomic formation of South and Central Asia confirmed that between 2000 BCE and 1400 BCE, a vast region of the Eastern European and Trans-Ural steppe had a relatively homogeneous population that was different from those who populated the region earlier. The distinguishing feature of this population was ancestry from the European farmer, the eastward reflux that was mentioned earlier, carrying the genetic mixture of the corded ware culture, was now common across the steppe. But there's a further distinction, as you move farther east to present day, Kazakhstan and as far as the Minusinsk Basin in Russia, the ancient DNA. Samples reflect the addition of another ancestry that the 2018 genomic formation study calls West Siberian Haplogroup or West Siberian underscore HG. This shows that as the Eastern Reflux reached Kazakhstan and farther east, it encountered and mixed with a population that already had a West Siberian underscore HG ancestral component. So the study created a new group, Step MLBA underscore East, to separate it from the Step MLBA underscore West, with no such ancestry. This is important for us because it is probably the Step MLBA underscore East that finally moved south from the Step to the BMAC and Turan, and then farther south to the Indian subcontinent. The genetic study characterizes the Step influx into South Asia only as Step MLBA since both MLBA underscore West and MLBA underscore East fit as sources for Indian ancestry, but it is likely that MLBA underscore East is what reached South Asia since it is geographically much closer to the subcontinent. The strong presence of R1AZ93 the Y-chromosome haplogroup of steppe origin found in India, in Kazakhstan is another reason. Does the study take us any closer to the date of the Aryan migration into South Asia? In many ways, it does, since the BMAC ancient DNA shows steppe presence only after 2100 BCE and is conspicuously absent before that, it is clear that a steppe migration to South Asia through this route could not have happened earlier. Considering that the BMAC isn't very far from South Asia and that it had had strong trade relations with the Harappans, it couldn't have been much later either. There is existing archaeological evidence that suggests that migrations towards South Asia from the BMAC may have started happening soon after. The first non-controversial evidence for the horse in the Harappan region comes from Pirik in Balochistan, and it is dated to 1800 BCE. In the late Harappan phase, Pirik also had figurines of horses made in terracotta and unburnt clay. Remember that there is no representation of the horse in any other Harappan seal or artifact. 
This means that the first steppe migrations into the Indian subcontinent could have almost coincided with the decline of the Harappan civilization. Parallels between South Asia and Europe There are unmissable parallels between the history of migrations into South Asia and the history of migrations into Western Europe, though they differ in the details. In Western Europe, agricultural technology was brought from West Asia by migrating Anatolian agriculturists between 7000 BCE and 5000 BCE. South Asia saw the arrival of Zagros herders around the same time, although it is open to question whether they brought a full-fledged agricultural package with them. As mentioned before, it is possible that early agricultural experiments had already begun in places such as Mergad in Balochistan and Lahuradiva in Uttar Pradesh, and the migrants may only have catalyzed the transition to agriculture by bringing in new domesticates. In Western Europe, the incoming Anatolian agriculturists and the resident hunter-gatherers mixed in varying degrees and gave birth to many Neolithic cultures. In South Asia, the incoming herders from Zagros mixed with the first Indians and went on to create the Harappan civilization. Europe later saw the arrival of steppe pastoralists who mixed with the local inhabitants to produce new population groups that created and or spread the corded ware, bell beaker and other cultures. In South Asia, the incoming steppe pastoralists mixed with the Harappans to create the new genetic cluster NI, while the Harappans mixed with the inhabitants of South India, the direct descendants of the first Indians, to create the new genetic cluster ASI. Both groups mixed again, to varying degrees in different regions and during different periods, to create the population of India as it is today. There is also a parallel between Europe and South Asia in the gender bias. That is reflected in the steppe migrations, as pointed out by Reich earlier in this chapter. As long as Indian geneticists were only looking at empty DNA of present-day Indians, they could not detect the steppe migrations. It is only when they began looking at the Y-chromosome ancestry that the reality of steppe migrations became clear. To quote Reich again, the preponderance of male ancestry coming from the steppe implies that male descendants of the Yamnaya with political or social power were more successful at competing for local mates than local groups. It is clear that there were extraordinary hierarchies and imbalances in power at work in the expansions from the steppe. It was the 2017 paper, A Genetic Chronology for the Indian. Subcontinent points to heavily sex-biased dispersals that brought attention to this gender disparity in India. The paper said, genetic influx from Central Asia in the Bronze Age was strongly male-driven, consistent with the patriarchal, patrilocal and patrilineal social structure attributed to the unferred pastoralist Indo-European society. The paper also said 70 to 90 percent of empty DNA lineages of present-day Indian population groups derive from first Indians, while only 10 to 40 percent of Y-chromosome lineages have similar ancestry. This difference is attributable to the sex bias in the later migrations. There is one crucial difference between the experiences of Western Europe and South Asia with multiple mass migrations. In Western Europe, each migration significantly replaced the previous population, while in South Asia, the replacement has been far less on the whole. For example, in many parts of Europe today, the percentage of the original hunter-gatherer ancestry has gone down to single digits, though there are some exceptions in Northern Europe. In India, by contrast, the ancestry of the first Indians still constitutes between 50 and 65 percent for most population groups when you look at the whole genome, as opposed to either Y chromosome or empty DNA separately. This difference is also visible in language distribution, 94% of Western Europeans today speak an Indo-European language while only about 75% of Indians do so. Dravidian languages are spoken by nearly 20% of Indians, while Western Europe has no non-Indo-European language with a similar strong presence. Interestingly, the only indigenous non-Indo-European language left standing in Western Europe today, Basque, is spoken in a region that withstood the massive steppe migrations into Europe. The Basques draw their ancestry more from the early European farmers, and the hunter-gatherers with whom they mixed, than from the steppe migrants. Therefore, it is not surprising that they got to retain their pre-steppe migration language and culture. There might be a parallel here with the Dravidian languages of South India in some ways as both managed to survive in areas that escaped the dominance of the steppe migrants.
the ancient DNA evidence for steppe migrations into Europe took many archaeologists by surprise because after the Second World War they had developed a disdain towards the Nazis and their theories and beliefs, which included the idea that they belonged to the superior and pure race of Aryans, unlike the East Europeans or the Jews. That they had conquered many lands in the past and spread their corded wear culture, and that they had, thus, the natural and inherited right to the lands of others around them. As part of this rejection of Nazi ideas, the archaeologists contested the suggestion that Europe in the past had seen invasions or migrations that had brought about culture change, but the new genetic discoveries have disproved both the archaeologists and the Nazis. Unlike what the archaeologists had believed, we now know that migrations did change the culture of Europe, and unlike what the Nazis had believed, the people they called Aryans, the steppe pastoralists, themselves were of mixed ancestry, not a pure race, by any stretch of the imagination. More poignantly, they came from Eastern Europe, a region that the Nazis had deep contempt for. Apart from the impulse to dismiss Nazi theories, many archaeologists and historians had other reasons too to doubt mass migrations. For example, the archaeologist Colin Renfrew thought that once farming took off and populations exploded, it would have been difficult for any new migrations to happen on a scale large enough to change the demography of these densely populated regions. So how did the Yamnaya manage to beat the odds? One explanation is that while populations did increase dramatically when agriculture spread, many regions were not densely inhabited. For example, the highest population estimate for the mature Harappan civilization, the largest civilization of its time, was 5 million, spread over a million square kilometers from Shortughai in Afghanistan to Sutkagan Dor on the Makran coast. And that is less than the population of just one city today, Ahmedabad. In the case of Europe, archaeological evidence suggests that the incoming Yamnaya converted large areas not occupied by European Neolithic farmers from forests to grassland, the kind of geography they were familiar with. But the possibility of another explanation became apparent when a paper, co-authored by the geneticist S. Willislev and others in 2015 said they had identified DNA sequences resembling Yersinia pastis, the bacterium that causes the plague, in seven ancient individuals out of the 101 they had analyzed, taken from Bronze Age Eurasia. The samples belonged to individuals buried in Yamnaya-linked cultures such as Cordedware, Afanasievo, Sintester and Andronovo. The study concluded, it has recently been demonstrated by ancient genomics that the Bronze Age in Europe and Asia was characterized by large-scale population movements, admixture and replacements, which accompanied profound and archaeologically described social and economic changes. In light of our findings, it is plausible that plague outbreaks could have facilitated or have been facilitated by these highly dynamic demographic events. If diseases carried by the new influx of people from the steppe played a part in changing the demography of Europe, it wouldn't be the last time this happened, of course. The diseases carried by the Europeans into the Americas played a significant role in decimating the original population of that continent. Did they play a part in the disappearance of the Harappan civilization too, which started declining around the same time that the early steppe migrants reached India? We won't know until we get direct ancient DNA evidence from cities such as Harappa, Monjo Daro or Kalibangan from the late Harappan period. But even if we discover that diseases did play a part in reducing the Harappan population, it is fairly certain that this was not the cause of the decline of the civilization because there is mounting evidence that it was a long period of drought that brought it down, around the same time that it was wrecking other civilizations such as those in Egypt, Mesopotamia and China. The most exhaustive, multi-year geological study on the possible reasons for the decline of the Harappan civilization was published in a 2012 paper titled, Fluvial Landscapes of the Harappan Civilization 5 which identified a clear cause, a prolonged drought that ultimately made monsoonal rivers go dry or become seasonal, affecting habitability along their courses. To quote, hydroclimatic stress increased the vulnerability of agricultural production supporting Harappan urbanism, leading to settlement downsizing, diversification of crops, and a drastic increase in settlements in the moister monsoon regions of the Upper Punjab, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh. This study's finding was confirmed in the strongest way possible when, in 2015, 
July 2018, the International Commission on Stratigraphy ICS, the official keeper of geologic time, introduced a new age called the Meghalayan, which runs from 2200 BCE to the present and which began with a mega drought that crushed a number of civilizations worldwide in Egypt, Mesopotamia, China and, of course, India. The mega drought was likely triggered by shifts in ocean and atmospheric circulation. So in hindsight, it looks like the British archaeologist and director general of the Archaeological Survey of India between 1944 and 1948, Sir Robert Eric Mortimer Wheeler, blamed the wrong person for the disappearance of the Harappan civilization when he wrote, on circumstantial evidence, Indra stands accused. He was suggesting, of course, that invading Aryans had destroyed the Harappan civilization, something for which there is no archaeological evidence. He should have looked more in the direction of Varuna, the Lord of Rain. After the decline, it is possible, of course, that the cause for the decline of the Harappan civilization was not singular, but plural. The long drought may have drained the civilization of its energy and also decimated its trade with Mesopotamia, which was going through its own crisis. The reigning ideology of the Harappan civilization may have collapsed as a result, leading to the disappearance of the symbols of power and commerce such as the ubiquitous seals and the script. There may have been internal rebellions, the Harappans may have taken the available option of moving to new fertile regions such as the Ganga Valley and starting afresh rather than finding new ways of keeping the old system going. And the influx of a new wave of warrior-like migrants from the Eurasian steppe might have been just the last straw that broke the system for good. But as we will see later, though the Harappan civilization may have gone into decline by around 1900 BCE, the people did not disappear and neither did the language nor all of the associated cultural beliefs and practices of the largest civilization of its time. This is because when the civilization dimmed due to the long drought, the Harappans spread out to both the east and the south, seeking new fertile land and carrying their language, culture and at least some of their practices with them. The Aryans arrived around this time or a little later with a pastoralist lifestyle, new religious practices such as large sacrificial rituals, a warrior tradition and mastery over the horse and metallurgy. The result was a mixing of populations and the formation of a new power elite that was dominant enough to ultimately force a language shift to Indo-European across northern India. Some of the beliefs and practices of the Harappans reshaped the religious ideology of the Aryans, while some other practices would have continued as folk religion and culture at a more popular level. In the south, the migrating Harappans would have found a more congenial atmosphere for their language and culture, partly because the Aryans had not yet reached peninsular India and, perhaps, partly because of the presence of earlier migrants who may have spread Dravidian languages. In the language of genetics, the Harappans contributed to the formation of the ancestral South Indians by moving south and mixing with the first Indians of peninsular India and also to the formation of the ancestral North Indians by mixing with the incoming Aryans, therefore, in many ways, they are the cultural glue that keeps India together, or the sauce on the pizza, to build on a metaphor that we used earlier that the newly dominant elite from the steppe had a clear preference for a non-urban, mobile lifestyle may be part of the reason why India had to wait for more than a millennium after the Harappan civilization, for its second urbanization, that began after 500 BCE as Anthony noted in Seven He Horse, the wheel and language, the Yamnaya were a mobile, pastoral people who caused the near disappearance of settlement sites wherever they came to dominate. Harappans and the Vedas disconnect and connect when the steppe migrants reached India, they would have come across a culture that already had its own myths, religious beliefs and practices and dominant language or languages, and was coping with a slowly unfolding disaster caused by the long drought. We do not yet know what different routes the people who called themselves Aryans may have taken, or how many different and competing groups there might have been. What we do know is that the visible disconnect between the Harappan culture as revealed by its archaeological remains and the Indo-European culture as revealed by the Vedas, starting with the earliest composition, the Rigveda, reduces over time. Here are a few examples of the early disconnect, the main gods and goddesses of the Rigveda, Indra, Agni, Varuna and the Ashwins, find no representation in the vast repertoire of Harappan imagery. The converse is also true, 
the Rigveda is of no help in trying to interpret the dominant symbols and imagery of the Harappan culture, such as the ubiquitous seals that display a unicorn with what looks like a brazier or manger in front, the script, the great bath of Mohenjo Daro and its significance, and so on. In fact, in one instance, the contrast between the Rigvedic principles and Harappan practice is quite striking. The Rigveda denounces Shishna Deva, literal meaning, phallus god or phallus worshippers, while Harappan artifacts leave no one in doubt that phallus worship was part of its cultural repertoire. The archaeologist R. S. Bisht, who excavated the most visually stunning Harappan site in India at Dolivera, says there is clear evidence of deliberate destruction of phallic symbols and idols both in Dolivera and other sites after the civilization declined. Book 7, 21.5 of the Rigveda says, may not the Shishna Deva approach a holy worship and Book 10, 99.3 describes how Indra slew them. Some authors have used lustful demons as the appropriate translation for Shishna Deva in this context, but the literal meaning of the original text and, of course, the animosity is quite clear. R. S. Bisht writes in his report on the Dolivera excavation, at least six examples of freestanding columns were discovered from the excavations. These freestanding columns are tall, and with a top resembling a phallus or they are phallic in nature. That is why most of them were found in an intentionally damaged and smashed condition. About the Dolivera statue of a seated man the report says, Stage 6 at Dolivera, dated to Bhavin 1950 BCE and 1800 BCE, is the late Harappan stage, when the mature phase of the civilization had ended and the site was even deserted for a while. According to the excavation report, stage 6 which appears at the site after a phase of desertion, is equally significant in that it not only brought out many changes of far-reaching consequence in planning, architecture and sigillography, relating to seals, as well as a quantum shift in economic structure, but also witnessed feverish commingling of communities. We do not know who or what caused the upheaval in stage 6 at Dolivera, it could have been an internal rebellion during the final stages of the Harappan civilization for all we know. But the existence of phallic symbols and statues at Harappan sites and the disdain for phallus worship visible in the Rigveda suggest a gap between them. Bisht is not a proponent of the idea that the Harappan civilization is not Aryan or Vedic, in fact, he believes that the kind of society that the Rigveda projects is close to what we find at the Harappan sites, however, he also admits that the Vedas looked down upon Shishna Devas and that the lack of the horse in the Harappan civilization is a problem in identifying this civilization as Vedic. Until the Harappan script is deciphered, he thinks, the dispute will continue. The disconnect between the Harappan world and the world of The earliest Veda is apparent in less ideological and more mundane matters too. For example, the rest of the civilized world at the time knew of the Harappan civilization as Melucha. The Harappans were involved in the politics of Mesopotamia, even to the extent of taking sides in their battles. And the economic relationship between Harappa and Mesopotamia was intimate enough for the Harappans to set up colonies in places such as the Oman Peninsula to facilitate trading and even mining. But these complex, sophisticated trading activities and urban relationships do not find reflection in the early Vedic corpus. The world of the Rigveda and the world that is revealed by the material culture of Harappa seem two very different universes, and this is without even bringing up the matter of the horse. Horse sense on Harappa The problem of the horse is this. The horse is rarely to be found in the Harappan civilization, neither is skeletal remains nor as images on seals and artifacts, while it is very prominent and ubiquitous in the Rigveda. So much so that two of the main gods, the Ashwins, are horsemen. Two other deities, Ushis and Agni, are described as riding horse-drawn chariots. In a hymn, the river Saraswati is described as, created vast for victory like a chariot, in fact, the presence of the horse in the Rigveda is so prominent that no other animal comes close. There are five hymns about the horse in the Rigveda, but only one about the bull, one about the goat and one about a bird. One of the hymns about the horse, Mandala 1, hymn 162, 7 refers to the horse sacrifice as follows. For those who do not accept the idea of Aryan migrations and insist that the Aryans were indigenous, it is axiomatic that the Harappan civilization was Vedic, or a creation of the Aryans, who composed the Vedas.
They make three arguments for why the lack of horses or chariots in the Harappan cities should not stand in the way of a Vedic identity for the civilization. 1. Horse bones are rare even in post-Harappan times, even though nobody doubts that horses were present then. Second, as the archaeologist B. B. Lal, the leading proponent of the Harappans as Vedic Ayans proposition, puts it, a wooden chariot, or anything wooden, is very difficult to find in the hot and humid climate of this country. I have not come across anything wooden, except a piece of grain. In Kalibangan, point three is that there has indeed been one internationally verified finding of horse bones at the Harappan site of Surkota Dai in Gujarat, dating back to between 2100 BCE and 1700 BCE. These bones were indeed examined by the archaeozoologist Professor Sando Bocconi, who had this to say, the occurrence of true horse, Equus cabalus, was evidenced by the enamel pattern of the upper and lower cheek and teeth and by the size and form of the incisors and phalanges toe bones, since no wild horses lived in India in post-Pleistocene times, i.e., after 9700 BCE. The domestic nature of the Surkotada horse is undoubtful. This statement makes two important points. 1. There have been no wild horses in India since Pleistocene, which lasted from 2.58 million years ago to 11,700 years ago. Therefore, the horse found at Surkotada has to be a domesticated one, not a wild one. But the corollary to these two statements is that if there were no wild horses in India in the last 11,700 years, then the horse was clearly not domesticated in India since horse domestication happened no earlier than 3500 BCE therefore, the Surkotada horse is either imported or belongs to a breed that was imported, even by Bocconi's own statement. Moreover, Bocconi's verification of the horse bones has itself been strongly challenged by equally respected archaeozoologists such as Richard Meadow. Even if you assume that Bocconi was right and Meadow was wrong, it still leaves a large gap between the kind of presence the horse wields in the Rigveda and the near-complete absence of horse and horse-related imagery in the Harappan culture, especially in the thousands of seals and ceilings that portray everything from mythical unicorns to bulls, buffaloes, peacocks, elephants, tigers and rhinoceroses. The hot, humid climate of the country shouldn't stop us from finding steatite seals of horses if they existed. Theoretically, even the physical presence of a horse or two in the Harappan civilization should not be surprising since there is historical record of the Harappans exporting Indian animals such as the elephant, water buffalo and the peacock to Mesopotamia, and importing a horse in return from there or elsewhere should raise no eyebrows. But that wouldn't change the overall picture of the serious disconnect between the role the horse plays in the Rigveda and the role it plays, or rather, does not play, in Harappan archaeological record and imagery. The archaeologist M. K. Dhavalikar had this to say on the Rigveda being clearly post Harappan when he discussed the issue of the horses and they. Vedas, the earliest Veda, in other words, post dates the Harappan civilization. Point 8. Remnants of a civilization the Vedic corpus was composed over many centuries, and it is important to remember that the discrepancy between it and the Harappan civilization reduces over time. The later the Vedic text, the more the likelihood of finding connections to the Harappan cultural heritage. If the Rigveda was antagonistic to, and disdainful of, Shishna Deva, by the time of the Upanishads, composed between 500 BCE and 100 BCE, this was no longer the case. The number of borrowed words from Dravidian languages is also higher in the later Vedic texts than in the earlier ones. There are many Harappan seals, ceilings and terracotta figurines that remind one of yoga, but there are no clear references to yoga in the Rigveda. But by the time of the Katha Upanishad, there are explicit references to it. A Harappan seal shows a figure wearing a horned headdress sitting in a yoga-like posture surrounded by animals, and it has been interpreted by some as an early depiction of Siva. Many historians and archaeologists reject this interpretation on the grounds that this is projecting later-day concepts into the distant past. While that may be so, it still leaves open the possibility of a convergence between later-day ideas of an ascetic Siva and the seal images, beliefs and myths of the Harappans. This is not surprising because over time incoming cultures often do.
adopt, adapt to and intermingle with existing cultures, and the Aryans and the Harappans may have done the same to varying degrees across cultural domains and geographic regions. And, of course, a lot of the cultural continuity from the Harappan civilization is reflected in popular practices rather than in the Vedic corpus. The way houses are built around courtyards, the bullock carts, the importance of bangles and the way they are worn, the manner in which trees are worshipped and the sacredness of the peepal tree in particular, the ubiquitous Indian cooking pot and the kulad, the cultic significance of the buffalo, designs and motifs in jewellery, pottery and seals, games of dice and an early form of chess dice and chess like boards have been found at multiple Harappan sites, the humble loter which is used to wash up even today and even the practice of applying sindur and some measurement systems the ways in which we carry on the traditions of the Harappan civilization are too many to count. A vase discovered at the Harappan site of Lothal in Gujarat has a painting that shows a crow standing next to a pitcher with a deer looking back at it, seemingly depicting the tale of the thirsty crow in the Panchtantra. So some of the tales we tell our children may have been the same ones told by the Harappans to their own children. What ended around 2000 BCE, therefore, was the power structure that had kept the civilization going for over seven centuries, and with it went the script, the seals, the standardized bricks and some of the ideology as well, such as the unicorn. But many other things that are part and parcel of the common man's life continued, along with some of the philosophical and cultural underpinnings of South Asia's first civilization. We may not recognize all of them, but they are the foundation on which our culture, traditions and history stand today. At the end of a long process of interaction between the Harappans and the Aryans, what we see are Indo-European languages replacing the earlier languages across much of northern, western and eastern India and a new syncretic culture emerging with elements recognizable from both the Harappan culture and the Rigveda. Just as the script and seals of the Harappans disappeared into the mist of prehistory, so did some of the early gods and rituals of the Vedas. The scriptural language of the Aryans, Sanskrit, the language in which one would expect to see the least change, as with all scriptural languages, itself changed to some extent due to its interaction with the Harappan languages. Retroflex consonants, to utter which you have to curl your tongue and strike your palate, which are very rare in Indo-European languages but very common in pre-Aryan Indian languages such as those belonging to the Dravidian language family, made their way into Rigvedic Sanskrit itself. Examples would include Pushti, Gana, Varna and Purna, considering that even Old Iranian, the most closely related language to Sanskrit, has no retroflex consonants, their increasing presence in Sanskrit over time is usually seen as the result of the influence of languages that were prevalent in India before Sanskrit arrived. The Rigveda has a limited number of borrowed words from Dravidian languages, but the number goes up steadily in the later Vedas.9. The corded were example the emergence of a new culture from the collision between the Harappans and the incoming Aryans is not surprising because that is exactly what happened a thousand years earlier when the steppe pastoralists streamed into Western Europe. The corded were culture in Europe, which is the most striking archaeological signal of the arrival of the steppe Yamnaya in Europe, was not brought by them from the steppe. It was the result of the interaction between the Yamnaya and the Neolithic farmers of Europe that they had come into contact with. This is how David Anthony explains it in Seven He Horse, The Wheel and Language. The material culture of the Corded Ware Horizon was mostly native to Northern Europe, but the underlying behaviors were very similar to those of the Yamnaya Horizon. The broad adoption of a herding economy based on mobility, using ox-drawn wagons and horses, and a corresponding rise in the ritual prestige and value of livestock. The defining traits of the corded ware horizon were, he writes, a pastoral, mobile economy that resulted in the near disappearance of settlement sites, much like Yamnaya in the steppes, the almost universal adoption of funeral rituals involving single graves under mounds, like Yamnaya, the diffusion of stone hammer axes and the spread of a drinking culture linked to particular kinds of cord decorated cups and beakers, many of which had local stylistic prototypes. In a paper published in the journal Antiquity in 2017, Christian Christiansen, professor of archaeology at the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, and three co-authors dug deeper into how the corded ware culture came about. The paper dwells on what steppe migrations to Europe involved, 
apart from massive burning down of forests to create steppe-like grazing lands for the herds. The authors found systematic evidence from multiple burial sites that showed that corded ware males practiced exogamy, marrying outside one's community, perhaps marriage by abduction, since many of the women buried in the graves were of non-local origin, and had a different diet during childhood. This is also supported by genetic evidence that showed more varied mtDNA haplogroups among corded ware females than among males. The study goes on to say, exogamy is a clever, and perhaps necessary, policy if new migrating groups are mainly constituted by males. This is a probable scenario for an expanding pastoral economy, and is supported by archaeological data from the early horizon of the single grave, corded ware culture in Jutland, in northern Germany and Denmark, where 90% of all burials belong to males. It gains further support from later historical sources from India to the Baltic and Ireland, they describe, as a typical feature of these societies, the formation of warrior youth bands consisting of boys from 12 to 13 up to 18 to 19 years of age, when they were ready to enter the ranks of fully grown warriors. Such youthful war bands were led by a senior male, and they were often named black youth, or given names of dogs and wolves as part of their initiation rituals. According to Christiansen and his co-authors, pastoral economies that are more warlike and mobile tend to dominate agrarian economies. Organized bands of young males from pastoralist societies go out to settle in new territories, often taking wives from farming cultures forcibly. The paper examines how the typical corded ware pottery came into being. The authors say the Yamnaya did not have a strong tradition of pottery making because their mobile lifestyle required using things that would not break easily and could be transported without difficulty in their wagons. For example, they usually made containers using leather, wood or the bark of trees. So in the burials of the earliest corded ware culture, there is no typical corded ware pottery. It appeared only later in Northern Europe, and the study says the reason for this was that corded ware pottery began only after women with ceramic skills married into the incoming Yamnaya culture and then began making ceramic ware that imitates the leather, wooden and woven containers of the Yamnaya. The confirmation of this theory, says the study, comes from the archaeological find of a well-preserved flat bowl with short feet made of wood, which can be used for turning milk into yogurt or other dairy products overnight. The ceramic version of this wooden utensil became a typical example of corded ware pottery across Europe. The precise ways in which an incoming people and culture engage with an existing people and their culture would, obviously, differ across time and space, however, it would be reasonable to assume that there would be some common threads between the massive steppe migrations into Europe and India, considering the shared customs and practices of the migrants. For example, King Bhoja's 11th century CE treatise on the use of Sanskrit for poetic and rhetoric compositions, Saraswati Kanta Bharna, Necklace of Saraswati, says, the language of the uncultured is not to be shown as, used at sacrificial rites, one should not show anyone speaking anything but Prakrit to women, nor mixed language to high-born people, nor Sanskrit to the uneducated. The injunction against poetic compositions showing anyone speaking to Women in anything other than Prakrit is perhaps a congealed convention that evolved out of a concern for realism, because women may have often belonged to a different, non-Aryan, language culture than the high-born, or Aryan, men from the steppes they were married to in the early period of the migrations. A multi-source civilization, not a single source one. Both in India and in Europe, the Indo-European language speakers were the last migrants significant enough to change the demography. India has seen multiple incursions since then, from Alexander's army in 326 BCE to the Sakasa the Scythians around 150 BCE, the Huns around 450 CE, the Arabs in 710 CE, the Mughals in 1526 CE, and then the Portuguese, the French, the Dutch and the British, but none of them have left more than a delicate and small impression on our demography, although their impact on our culture has often been bigger. This we can say now with certainty thanks to DNA and the science of genetics, and no migration or invasion is likely to change our demography in the future either. Hence the name of this chapter, The Last Migrants. Our common history has been about creating a unique culture that draws its elements from multiple traditions and experiences. We are a multi-source civilization, not a single source one.
By the time the last migrants, the Aryans, arrived sometime after 2000 BCE, Indians in the subcontinent were already one of the largest modern human populations on Earth, if not the largest had already led an agricultural revolution and then an urban revolution leading up to the creation of the largest civilization of its time, and was spearheading an agricultural transition in almost every region, in the north, south, east and west. It would be accurate to say that the very foundation of India as we know it was laid during the period of the Harappan civilization. The millennium or so that followed the dimming of the Harappan, Civilization would have been the most tumultuous and turbulent period in the history of the modern human in South Asia. But we have very little record of this and hence very little understanding of it. Look at all that. Happened, a long-standing civilization, the largest of its kind at the time, fell apart due to the ravages of a long drought, and its most visible symbols of power and prestige slowly disappeared even as urbanism itself did. People migrated to the east and the south in search of a new life. A new set of migrants came in from the northwest, bringing new languages and a different culture that put emphasis on sacrificial rituals and prioritized pastoralism and cattle breeding over urban settlements. Another set of migrants came in from the northeast, bringing new languages, new domesticated plants and perhaps wetland farming techniques and a new variety of rice, and thus the pot of Indian culture was put on the boil. 4,000 years later, it is still simmering, with new ingredients getting added once in a while, from the Jews to the Syrians to the Parsis. Epilogue Seeing History The Right Side Up A Subjective Commentary On What This Book Tells Us, and An Examination Of How Caste Came To Be. Over the four chapters of this book, we saw how the Indian pizza got made, with the base or the foundation being laid about 65,000 years ago, when the out-of-Africa migrants reached India. The sauce began to be made when the Zagrosian herders reached Balochistan after 7000 BCE, mixed with the first Indians, and then together went on to build the Harappan civilization. When the civilization fell apart, the sauce spread all over the subcontinent. Then came the Ayans after 2000 BCE, and cheese was sprinkled all over the pizza, but a lot more in the north than in the south. Around the same time arrived the major toppings which we see today in different regions in different amounts, the Austroasiatic and Tibeto-Burman language speakers. And then, much later, of course, came the Greeks, the Jews, the Huns, the Sakas, the Parsis, the Syrians, the Mughals, the Portuguese, the British, the Siddhis, all of whom have left small marks all over the Indian pizza. Like all metaphors this is a silly oversimplification, of course, but is useful to the extent that it helps correct deeply embedded and problematic misconceptions about who we are. It is commonly thought that the Adivasis, or original inhabitants, or tribals, who form about 8% of the population, are very distant and very different from the rest of the Indian population, a perception that has led to them being looked down upon, not just as people who have chosen to continue a particular lifestyle, but as people who are not us. Now we know this is baseless, The tribals are us. The tribals share much with the rest of the population genetically since. They carry the ancestry of the first Indians and they ought to be seen as the foundational population of India as it is today. As we have seen, 50 to 65 percent of whole genome ancestry of the Indian population comes from the descendant lineages of the first Indians. And there is no population group in India today that does not carry first Indian ancestry, no matter what language it speaks or where in the caste hierarchy it falls. How appropriate it is then that the most recognizable image of the Harappan civilization is the dancing girl cover image, who could very well be a tribal girl. As we saw in chapters 2 and 3, first Indians were a part of that first urban revolution. Aside. We do not know, of course, whether the girl was dancing, what we do know is that she has a powerfully attractive, insouciant stance that denotes energy and authenticity even today. The disdain towards tribals and scheduled castes comes from an inbuilt belief system that others them and now we know why this othering needs to go. This attitude also reflects in the general unconcern for our own prehistorical sites. From Jalapuram to Bhimaka to Dolivira, the lack of interest in and identification with these sites is almost as palpable as in the case of our western neighbors similar indifference to historical sites that predate the arrival of Islam in the subcontinent, 
we will know that we have matured and owned our past in the full sense when prehistorical sites in India start attracting enough visitors who are excited and thrilled to see what their ancestors did and how they lived. The second misperception that the pizza metaphor helps correct is about the origins of the common culture that we can experience today across the subcontinent. It is now possible to see that the foundational source for much of this common culture is the mighty Harappan civilization that lasted seven centuries in its mature form and was the largest one of its time, both in terms of population and area. Ayabarta and Magadha Much of what happened in the centuries after the decline of the Harappan civilization and the arrival of migrants from the steppe lies in relative archaeological darkness, which is not surprising considering migrating groups of steppe pastoralists elsewhere were not big on permanent settlements. As mentioned earlier, we do not know what routes the Aryan migrants took, or how many groups there might have been, or for what period the migrations may have continued. But we do know from the early Vedic texts that there were conflicts between Indo-European language-speaking groups, so multiplicity of migrations is probably a given. Linguistics and now genetics can throw a little more light on the migration process. According to the Grierson hypothesis that was advanced in the 1930s, by Sir George Grierson, compiler of the Linguistic Survey of India, and then built on by Franklin C. Southworth in 2005, Indo-Aryan languages can be subdivided into two sociolinguistic regions, one of them being the inner or north central, and the other being the outer or southwestern eastern. In this division, the north central languages would include Hindi, Punjabi, Rajasthani, Bundeli and Pahari, while southwestern eastern would include Bangla, Bihari, Oriya, Marathi and Konkani. Southworth deals with the subject in a long chapter in Seven He Linguistic Archaeology of South Asia, and he says such a division can be accounted for by assuming a long, slow influx of Central Asian herding peoples moving into the Indo-Iranian borderlands, to the Punjab and then on the one hand eastwards to the Ganga, and on the other hand, down the Indus to the Deccan and further east. The genetic evidence too suggests that there was indeed a substructure within the Aryan populations that migrated to India which may correspond to the linguistic substructure pointed out by Grierson and Southworth. This is what the 2018 paper, The Genomic Formation of South and Central Asia, says on the subject, after noting that 10 out of 140 present-day Indian population groups studied had significantly elevated steppe ancestry. We found the strongest two signals of steppe ancestry in Brahman underscore Tiwari and Brahman underscore UP and more generally there was a striking enrichment of signals in groups of traditionally priestly status which was most notable in northern India. The enrichment is striking as these groups are among the traditional custodians of texts written in early Sanskrit. A possible explanation is that the influx of steppe middle to late bronze ancestry into South Asia in the mid-second millennium created groups with different proportions of steppe ancestry, with one having relatively more steppe ancestry having a central role in spreading early Vedic culture. To paraphrase this in the context of the linguistic evidence, not all groups of migrating Indo-Europeans had the same social attitudes or approaches. Some, perhaps belonging to the inner groups, to use the geographical terminology of Grierson, were highly orthodox in their social relations, and perhaps language use, and genetically mixed less with the local population, while those belonging to the outer groups were much less rigid. This difference that is noticeable in linguistics and genetics is also noticeable in textual references, especially those relating to Ayavarta and M. Lechadisa. As noted in Greater Magadha, written by Johannes Bronkhorst, Emeritus Professor of Sanskrit and Indian Studies at the University of Lausanne, the grammarian Patanjali asks an interesting question and then answers it himself in his commentary Mahabhasya, written around 150 BCE, which is the land of the Aryas? It is the region to the east of where the Saraswati disappears, west of the Kalaka forest, south of the Himalayas, and north of the Pariyatra mountains. The Kalaka forest is traditionally assumed to be near the confluence of the Ganga and the Yamuna and the Pariyatra mountains to be the Vindhyas, since many other records mention Ayavarta as the land between the Ganga and the Yamuna. The passage from Patanjali's Mahabhasya occurs in virtually identical form in some other texts, viz. The Buddhana Dharma Sutra and the Vashishta Dharma Sutra, writes Bronkhorst, he continues, both these texts add that, 
according to some, Ayavarta as the land between the Ganga and the Yamuna, which supports the idea that the Kalaka forest was indeed situated at or near the confluence of these two rivers. Olivelle argues that these two Dharma Sutras are later than Patanjali. If this is correct, it supports the view that the region east of the confluence of the Ganga and the Yamuna was still more or less foreign territory for many Brahmins even after Patanjali. Note that this definition of Ayavarta roughly corresponds with the inner linguistic group in the north-central region as defined by Grierson and Southworth, as opposed to the outer linguistic group of the southwestern eastern region. Remember that when Patanjali was defining the land of the Aryas, the areas to its east were already occupied by Indo-European language speakers and, in fact, these regions were the major center of the second urbanization of India that began around 500 BCE, much after the decline of the Harappan civilization. The first Indian empire, that of the Mauryas 322-180 BCA, had also arisen in this region, outside of the closely defined Ayavarta. This was the region called Magadha that gave rise to both Jainism and Buddhism between the 7th and 5th centuries BCE. Buddhism as dated to between the 6th and 4th centuries BCE and Jainism to between the 7th and 5th centuries BCE. Both these religions challenged the existing scriptures, sacrificial rituals and social orthodoxy. What accounts for the aversion that the elite of Ayavarta had for Thay? M. Lechardesis, this is how Bronkhorst sees it. According to the passages cited above, the region east of the confluence of the Ganga and the Yamuna was not considered Brahmanical territory at the time of Patanjali. This does not exclude that there were Brahmins living there. Rather, it suggests that the Brahmins living in it did not receive the esteem which they deemed themselves entitled to. In Patanjali's Ayavarta, on the other hand, we may assume that they did receive this esteem, at least to some extent. The Brahmins' predominant social position in this region allows us to use the expressions Brahmanical society or Vedic society for the period during which Vedic texts were still being composed. These expressions do not, of course, imply that all members of this society were Brahmins, even less that they were all Brahmins who performed Vedic rituals. The defining characteristic of Brahmanical society would have been large sacrificial rituals involving substantial gifts to the priestly class and a close and symbiotic relationship between the rulers and the Brahmins. According to Bronkhorst, the political history of the Ganga Valley east of the Ganga Yamuna confluence supports the idea that this region was not the ideal Brahmanical society. It is here that the foundations were laid for the Mauryan Empire that came to cover a large part of the South Asian subcontinent. If our sources can be believed, none of the rulers involved were especially interested in the Brahmins and their ideas. The early kings of Magadha, Srenaka, Bimbasara and Ajatsitru, were claimed as their own by Buddhists as well as by Jainas. The Nandas, who consolidated imperial power at Pataliputra around 350 BCE, appear to have become zealous patrons of the Jainas. Chandragupta Maurya overthrew the Nandas, but may have had no more interest in the Brahmins than those whom he replaced. He himself is said to have converted to Jainism and died a Jaina saint. His son Bindusara patronized non-Brahmanical movements, particularly the Ajivikas. His son Asoka was interested in Buddhism, his immediate successors in Ajivikism and Jainism. It is only with the Sungas, who were Brahmins themselves, that Brahmins may have begun to occupy the place in society which they thought was rightfully theirs. This happened around 185 BCE. Forty or fifty years later, as we have seen, Patanjali the grammarian was still not ready to look upon the Ganga's valley east of the confluence with the Jamna as being part of the land of the Aryas. This view of Magadha did ultimately change, of course, as Bronkhorst notes. In the Manava Dharma Shastra or Manusmriti written sometime before the 3rd century CE, Ayavarta was defined as ranging from sea to sea. The land between the same mountain ranges, i.e., Himalaya and Vindhya, extending from the eastern to the western sea is what the wise call, Ayavarta, the land of the Aryas. Somewhere between the composition of the Mahabhasya and the Manusmriti, the ideology of Magadha had perhaps changed enough for the elite of Ayavarta to consider it as their own. We will come back to this soon. The difference between the inner and outer traditions might explain why.
the caste system fell into place when it did, and only when it did. The theory that incoming ions imposed the caste system on the population when they arrived in the subcontinent has been proved wrong by a genetic study published in 2013 titled, Genetic Evidence for Recent Population Mixture in India. It was co-authored by Priya Murjani, Kumara Sami Thangaraj, Lalji Singh, David Reich and others. The results of the study that these scientists had conducted, based on genome-wide data from 73 population groups in the Indian subcontinent, was stunning. The study showed that between 2200 BCE and 100 CE, there was extensive admixture between the different Indian populations with the result that almost all Indians had acquired first Indian, Harappan and steppe ancestries, though, of course, to varying degrees. The paper says, India experienced a demographic transformation several thousands of years ago, from a region in which major population mixture was common to one in which mixture even between closely related groups became rare because of a shift to endogamy marrying within the community. We have already seen how, when the Harappan civilization began declining, as a consequence of the long drought and the arrival of new migrants, there were large-scale population movements from the northwest to both south and east, and much intermixing. So that is not surprising, even though the study reveals that the mixing was quite deep going, nearly all groups experienced major mixture in the last few thousand years, including tribal groups like Bhil, Shamar and Kallar that might be expected to be more isolated. What is surprising, because it is counterintuitive, is that the mixing came to an end sometime around 100 CE. One can imagine two separate groups who had maintained their genetic distance for a long time suddenly deciding that enough was enough and starting to mix. But it is more difficult to visualize groups that had already been mixing waking up one day and deciding to put a stop to it, and creating barriers to continued intermixing. The genetic study says that this is exactly what happened. It was as if around 100 CE a new ideology, which had gained ground and power, imposed on the society new social restrictions and a new way of life. It was social engineering on a scale never attempted before or after, and it succeeded wildly, going by the results of genetic research. The study links the sudden downing of the shutters on intermixing to the beginning of the caste system, the four-class Varna system, comprised of Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, and Sudras, is mentioned only in the part of the Rigveda that was likely to have been composed later. The caste, Jati system of endogamous groups having specific social or occupational roles is not mentioned in the Rigveda at all and is referred to only in texts composed centuries after the Rigveda. Could the end of the Maurya Empire in the closing centuries of the first millennium BCE have had anything to do with this change in ideology? Did the defeat of the Mauryas also presage the eventual disappearance of Buddhism from the subcontinent and the decline of Jainism? Could the orthodox traditions of Ayavarta, with a more rigid view of social hierarchy and opposition towards Varnasankalana, or mixing between different classes or races, have defeated the more open, freewheeling, progressive and anti-ritualistic ideologies of Magadha that had posed a challenge to it? Did the rapid expansion of the Maurya Empire into the heartland of Ayavarta between the 4th and 2nd centuries BCE threatened the Brahmanical ideology based on sacrifices, the supremacy of Brahmins and their special relationship with rulers, and did Ayavarta strike back in response? Did they, then, over time, manage to impose their own long-held ideals of purity and strong endogamy on the rest of society, including the Indo-European language speakers of Eastern India? who did not share those ideals, though they called themselves, Ions too. Bronkhorst addresses some of these questions in his book. A few things follow from this discussion. The caste system in India is not coterminous with the arrival of the Ions in the subcontinent. It fell in place around the ankles of Indian society only about two millennia later. And by the time it came about, intermixing had already taken place to varying degrees. So Ambedkar was right when he stated that the Sudras were not genetically different from the rest of Indian caste society. But perhaps he did not go far enough, he seems to have still considered the tribals to be different from everyone else. We now know that this is not correct, because their genes run through everyone, no matter where in the caste hierarchy one is.
Ambedkar was also wrong in denying Aryan migrations altogether, though he cannot be blamed for the mistake since he did not have the genome data that we have today. The cultural effervescence in eastern India or Magadha began in the centuries before the flowering of the Maurya Empire and can be seen in such things as urbanization, new religions and philosophies and the rising affluence and prominence of the trading classes. It had already spread its influence and ideas across the subcontinent and far outside of it too, before the gates of the caste system were installed and closed, perhaps over several generations and centuries, thus turning the country inward in many ways. A period of achievements and adventures the five or six centuries before the beginning of the common era and a couple of centuries after it would rank as one of the most creative and progressive periods in the history of India. The composition of the Upanishads, the insights and philosophy of which have inspired millions across the world and influenced much of the thought of the Indian subcontinent. The rise of the world's first missionary religions, Jainism and Buddhism, that took the teachings of their founders as well as new linguistic ideas and literary forms to all corners of India and, in the case of Buddhism, to many corners of the then known world, the bringing of East Asia under the spell of Indian cultural ideas the mesmerizing of China. The list is as long as it is exciting. Most of the overseas overtures, outreaches and adventures would have begun either from the eastern or southern parts of India, which would have been without the kind of restrictions on intermixing and voyages across the seas that Ayavata found necessary to impose. The momentum of these strong cultural currents carried on for many centuries after a new social hierarchy and a new way of living became common in the subcontinent and mixing between groups of the kind that was seen earlier had become taboo. Sanskrit, as the new language of the elite and the medium of intellectual discourse, probably became more influential than any other language in ancient history, with the possible exception of Latin, and Sanskrit spread more by persuasion and by in rather than military invasions as in the case of Latin, as explained beautifully by Sheldon Pollock in his majestic book 7 He Language of the Gods in the World of Men. Kings and aspiring kings all over the subcontinent and across the seas in Southeast Asia wanted the prestige and comfort that Sanskrit offered, along with its theory of kingship and social structure that seemed to find a ready market among elites everywhere. A powerful body of literature including the two mega-epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharat, which remain unrivaled in their ability to enthrall and inspire, carried in its sinews the new theory of power and social relationships that was perhaps as convincing for those at the receiving end of it as for those at the giving end of it. This was not inevitable but there was also a huge social cost to the new social construct, as indicated by genetics again, as David Reich explains it in Who We Are and How We Got Here. People tend to think India with its more than 1.3 billion people is having a tremendously large population and indeed many Indians as well as foreigners see it this way. But genetically, this is an incorrect way to view the situation. The Ha Chinese are truly a large population. They have been mixing freely for thousands of years. In contrast, there are few if any Indian groups that are demographically very large, and the degree of genetic differentiation among Indian Jati groups living side by side in the same village is typically two or three times higher than the genetic differentiation between Northern and Southern Europeans. The truth is that India is composed of a large number of small populations. In essence, the social structure that was imposed in the second century CE has cut the country into Tukde, Tukde pieces to use the vocabulary of television news channel discussions in 2018. When you divide up a people like that, a society's ability to maximize the potential of its individuals is severely affected and, equally importantly, fellow feeling even among people who live in the same locality is dampened, thus aborting the possibility of common actions that would benefit everyone. To what extent this has hampered India, as a nation, is perhaps a question that only sociologists will be able to answer, hopefully quantitatively, someday. What we know now is that this was not inevitable. This was not the direction in which India was heading till around 100 CE when we seem to have halted suddenly and turned back on an issue of crucial social importance. It would be wrong to think, though, that the ideological confrontation between what Ayavarta represented, or perhaps what an elite group within it represented and preferred, and what Magadhar or Eastern India represented and practiced came to an abrupt halt.
Buddhism kept going for centuries after its defeat in the land of its birth, though its position grew weaker and weaker. That some of these battles were still being fought seven centuries after. The arrival of the caste system in 100 CE we know from the work of Adi Shankara who took on the philosophies of Buddhism and Jainism. We also know this from archaeological and literary sources that have recorded continuing disputation, both intellectual and physical, and from theological movements like Bhakti that gave voice to the voiceless. That Bhimrav Ambedkar chose Buddhism for himself and his followers when he wanted to challenge still existing inequities in the 20th century shows how the historical threads of a difference of opinion on the way a society ought to be constructed have continued to this day. In this sense, the spectacular ideological confrontation between Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi and Bhimrav Ambedkar too can be seen as a contest between the best of the philosophy of life and society that the conservative Ayavrata had to offer and the best of the rationality and progressivism that Magadha had to offer. To quote the historian Romila Thapar, when we assess our cultural heritage, we often tend to forget or we downplay the fact that rationality and skepticism were very much a part of early Indian thought. This was not limited to the Kavaka, Lokaita thinkers but is also clear from some other schools of philosophy, as indeed it is noticeable in Buddhist and Jaina thought. We have inherited a tradition of questioning, which was not limited to philosophical thought but is apparent in popular literature as well. It would be as well to nurture that tradition. Common questions, multiple answers if our prehistory should teach us anything, it is that old cliché, unity in diversity. We live in a geographical region that can be termed a common civilizational and conversational area. The topics of our intellectual and cultural discussions, debates and disputes are uniquely our own but we do not have a consensual set of answers. Our answers and responses are dependent upon the different traditions and historical experiences that different groups among us carry. We as Indians have lived through the same history too, but we have experienced some of it from different ends. The difference in political or even eating preferences between southern and eastern India on the one hand, and northern and western India on the other hand, are a reflection of the kind of differences that there are, and some of them are deep going. Take, for example, our food habits. It is clear that North Indians and Western Indians consume far more milk and milk products and far less meat and fish than East Indians or South Indians. Politicians and commentators often look at these differences as socio-political in nature. But these have a more foundational reason, genes. Or more specifically, a gene mutation called 13910T which originated in Europe some 7,500 years ago. This gene allows the human body to digest milk beyond infancy, into adulthood. Homo sapiens are the only mammals in the world who have acquired this ability. This is not surprising because before humans figured out they could keep cattle or goats and exploit them for milk, such a mutation would have been unnecessary. But once they started domesticating cattle, the ability to digest milk as adults would have become tremendously useful, and a mutated gene that fit the bill was selected over time by evolution. The ability to digest milk even into adulthood evolved more than once, in four different areas of the world. But the European mutation 13910T is of particular interest to us because most Indians who have the ability to consume milk as adults carry this European version. A countrywide screening of DNA samples from all major language groups and regions of India too to answer questions about lactase persistence, the technical term for the ability to digest milk after infancy came to many conclusions, three of which are as follows. First, its distribution in India follows a general northwest to southeast declining pattern. Second, the mutation is identical to the European one. Third, only about a fifth of Indians can digest milk into adulthood, with people in western and northern India being the most likely to do so. The frequency of the gene ranges from over 40% in certain parts of western and northern India to less than 1% in parts of northeast India. So this finally clarifies why East Indians or South Indians drink far less milk than North and West Indians. As adults, many of them are unable to digest it. It bears repeating that all children can consume milk, whether they have the gene or not.
The difference between those who have the gene and those who do not is that while those with the gene can go on drinking and digesting milk for the rest of their lives, others will lose this ability sometime between their first year and adulthood. What has all this got to do with vegetarianism, or the relative difference in consumption of meat and fish between the north and west on the one hand and south and east on the other? It is simply this, the ability to digest milk as adults gives those Indians with the gene mutation an option to substitute milk for meat or fish as a source of animal protein, which many of them seem to have taken. This is borne out by surveys of household consumer expenditure carried out by the National Sample Survey. These figures show that, by and large, states consuming a lot more milk consume a lot less meat, fish and eggs, while states consuming a lot more meat, fish and eggs consume a lot less milk. Clearly, there is a trade-off happening here between milk and meat, but only in some regions. Please also note that regions consuming more milk and less meat are precisely those with a greater prevalence of the gene mutation, and vice versa. What the gene story tells us is that there are good reasons behind the patterns we see on India's sociological map and for the differing answers given to common questions of our civilization, including what to eat and what not to eat. To try to erase these differences and patterns to create a monoculture would be a typically un-Indian enterprise, prone to mishaps and doomed to failure. One reason for the continuing and doomed attempt to force fit an artificial uniformity on Indian culture is the way our history is written, often with justification. Until now, it made sense for history books to begin at that point in time when records became available and to ignore the earlier parts or, at most, dismiss them in a few paragraphs or pages. In India, this meant that everyone began to consider the beginning of our history to be around 4,500 years ago, when the Harappan civilization reached its mature stage, or perhaps when the Vedas were composed centuries later, with a lot many people wrongly conflating these two events. This was understandable because until recently there was no easy way of confirming what went on in prehistory and all that anyone could do was make intelligent guesses. But this is rapidly changing, in India and elsewhere, thanks to ancient DNA. As more and more of it is accessed and analyzed all across Eurasia, we are gaining a more granular understanding of our own prehistory and the time has come to begin writing our history from where it should begin, with the arrival of modern humans in India some 65,000 years ago. History, if it is to be undistorted and connected with the people of the country, should be built the right side up, starting with the base, the foundation of our population today, the first Indians. This shouldn't be difficult. The genius of our civilization, during its best periods, has been inclusion, not exclusion. The Harappan civilization was built by a population with the shared ancestry of first Indians and the early agriculturists of the Zagros region in Iran. When Buddhist missionaries first carried India's cultural ethos beyond its borders to China, Southeast Asia and Central Asia, it was driven by a missionary zeal that was global and all-encompassing, without discrimination of caste, creed or race. It drew its principles and practices from all parts of India's previous history including that of the Aryans, even while challenging rituals, sacrificial practices and ideas of hierarchy. It was, therefore, natural that Buddhism became the first philosophy in the world that felt the burning desire to share its insights and message of compassion with all humans, without regard for man-made or natural borders. That the Buddha's message still flourishes, with 488 million adherents around the world trying to live up to the principles he enunciated, is testimony to the global appeal of a uniquely Indian philosophy, rooted in the same soil from which the Upanishads grew and drawing sustenance from the same impulses. The two opposing views of India's history, the unchanging India, that was somehow stuck in a bad place without knowing how to move on, as Karl Marx saw it, or an India that has degraded over time from the Vedic perfection of time immemorial, are both wrong and based on misperceptions. India has been ever-changing, not unchanging, and its story is definitely not one of decline. India's history has been dynamic, as full of energy and full of contention as any lively society's history would be, and this, despite the dead weight of casteism that we have carried for two millennia. So who are we Indians, really?
The best way we can define ourselves as is a multi-source civilization, not a single source one, drawing its cultural impulses, its traditions and its practices from a variety of heredities and migration histories. The out-of-Africa migrants, the fearless pioneering explorers who reached this land around 65 millennia ago and whose lineages still form the bedrock of our population. Those who arrived from West Asia and contributed to the agricultural revolution and the building of the Harappan civilization which then became the crucible for new practices, concepts and the Dravidian languages that enrich much of our culture today. Those who came from East Asia, bringing with them new languages and plants and farming techniques. And those who migrated here from Central Asia, carrying an early version of what would become a great language, Sanskrit, and all its associated beliefs and practices that have reshaped our society in fundamental ways, and those who came even later seeking refuge of a conquest of a trade, and then chose to stay, all have mingled and contributed to this civilization we call Indian. We are all Indians. And we are all migrants. It is perhaps no coincidence that Pushyamitra, the Sunga general who killed the last Maurya and created the Sunga dynasty, settled, if Kalidasa's Malavikagnamitra can be trusted, not in Pataliputra, but far from it, in Vidisa, writes Bronkhorst. Irene Gallagher Romero, et al. Herders of Indian and European cattle share their predominant allele for lactase persistence, molecular biology and evolution, 2012. Appendix The Valley of the Ghaggar Hakra Despite the mounting ancient DNA evidence for migrations from the Eurasian steppes that changed the demography in a vast region extending from Europe to South Asia, there are some who insist that the story of the Aryan migrations is a vast conspiracy spanning multiple generations, continents and scientific disciplines. One of their main arguments is built around identifying the mighty river Saraswati mentioned in the Rigveda with the rain-fed, mostly dry, seasonal river Ghaggar that originates in the foothills of the Sivalik hills and flows through Punjab, Haryana and Rajasthan before going across to Cholestan and then Sindh, both in Pakistan. The river is mostly known as Ghaggar in India, and Hakra after that. It is commonly accepted today that there were a large number of Harappan settlements in the valley of the Ghaggar Hakra and that the Harappan civilization is best described as being based on two river systems, the Indus and the Ghaggar Hakra. From here on, this is how the argument of the migration denialists goes. Ghaggar Hakra is indeed the ancient Saraswati because it fits neatly into the geographic description of the ancient river in the Rigveda as lying between the Yamuna and the Satlaj. Saraswati became the weak, seasonal stream that it is today only because sometime around 2000 BCE tectonic activity diverted the Himalayan snowmelt that used to flow into it. One tectonic event diverted the Satlaj, which used to flow into the Saraswati Ghaggar Hakra, and made it join the river bees and then both together flowed into the Indus. The other tectonic event caused a terrace to rise in the Himalayas, diverting glacial waters away from the Saraswati and into the Yamuna. This enfeeblement of the Saraswati is what caused the decline of the large number of Harappan settlements all along the Saraswati Basin, from Rakhigadi and Kalibangan in India to Ganveriwala in Pakistan and consequently, the end of the Harappan civilization itself. But since the Rigveda talks about the Saraswati in glowing terms and refers to it as a mighty river that is powerful enough to break mountain tops, the Vedic people must have been present in the Saraswati valley when the river had not yet lost its power and that means they must have been there during Harappan times. And, therefore, the Vedic people are the Harappans. This may look like a thin argument to put up against all the evidence for steppe migrations into Europe and South Asia, but it is an argument that has got attention because of the epic resonance of the name of the river Saraswati. However, there are serious problems with the argument. Let us go through them one by one. To begin with, there is no certainty that the Saraswati described as mighty and powerful enough to break mountain tops in the Rigveda is the one in India and not the Haraviti River in Afghanistan which the Aryans may have become familiar with on their journey into India through Afghanistan. It is a common practice for the letter H in Indo-Aryan to be interchanged with the letter S in Indo-Iranian and vice versa. Well-known examples being Hindu becoming Sindhu and Sapta Sindhu becoming Hapta Hindu. So Haraviti and Saraswati are virtually the same name. 
Today, Haraviti is known as Arghandab, the main tributary of the Helmand, a Himalayan snowmelt fed river. Helmand is indeed a mighty river powerful enough to break mountain tops. It is also possible that the name of the river in Afghanistan that the Ayans came across first was later transferred to a more feeble, rain fed river now known as Ghaggar Hakra, lying between the Satlaj and the Yamuna, and the descriptions of the later Saraswati in the Rigveda are written from a composite memory. Names of favorite heroes, rivers, and places keep cropping up many times all over India, after all. There are also several rivers in India today that take their name from Saraswati.1. But there are other big problems too. The Saraswati or Ghaggar Hakra seems to have dried up not once, but many times. There is no sanctity to the date of 2000 BCE for when the river Saraswati was unfeebled. This is so even according to Robert Reichs, the internationally acclaimed hydrologist whose name is often quoted by those who equate the Vedic people with the Harappans. In 1968 Reich studied the major Harappan site Kalaibangan near the Ghaggar Hakra and wrote a paper for the academic journal Antiquity, titled Kalaibangan, Death from Natural Causes. Reich says that, The abandonment of Kalibangan was caused by the drying up of the river, but then goes on to write, the general hypothesis, which emerges from the calculations that form part of the full article, and from the archaeological evidence that fits so neatly into the picture, is of alternating capture of the Yamuna by the Indus and Ganges systems respectively. In other words, in the low-lying delta between the Indus and the Ganga, Rikers sees the waters flowing into the Ganga through the Yamuna, or into the Indus through the Saraswati and the Satlaj, at different periods. He then furnishes a table that shows five alternating diversions of water to the Indus and the Ganga between 2500 BCE and 500 CE, the diversion that caused the abandonment of Kalibangan being only one of them. So even if the Ayans were indeed describing today's Ghaggar Hakra as the Saraswati in the Rigveda, it does not necessarily mean this was based on observations made before 2000 BCE, during the Harappan period, because the Ghaggar Hakra river could have been alive during periods even after the decline of the Harappan civilization. The archaeologist V. N. Mishra also made the same assessment, based on his study of sites distribution in the Saraswati Valley, he wrote in 1993. All this evidence shows that the hydrological history of the Ghaggar Hakra is a highly complex one, suggesting that the shifting of the Sitlaj and Yamuna courses into and away from the Ghaggar Hakra was neither a unique nor a simultaneous event, instead it took place in multiple episodes. Dot dot. In the light of new data, it can be stated with certainty that both Satlaj and the Yamuna flowed in the Ghaggar bed in the past, during the period of the Harappa civilization as well as before and after it. In other words, the date of the last drying up of the Saraswati Ghaggar Hakra remains wide open, and it cannot be used to claim that the Rigveda was composed before the Harappan civilization declined. The Vedic people could have been on the banks of a river they called Saraswati much after the end of the Harappan civilization. But could the Ghaggar Hakra have been a mighty river during Vedic times? Michael Witzel, Wales professor of Sanskrit at Harvard University, points out a difficulty. The migration denialists believe the Saraswati dried up in part because of a tectonic event that caused the Satlaj, which earlier used to flow into the Saraswati, to join the bees and then flow into the Indus. But in Hymn 33, Book 3, of the Rig Veda, the Satlaj is described as joining the bees and then flowing together. This means that by the time the Rig Veda was composed, the Saraswati had already lost the Satlaj waters to the Indus, assuming that it had them earlier, it could not, therefore, have been a mighty river that could break mountain tops. Here's a part of the hymn that describes the Satlaj joining the bees, as translated by T. R. Griffith. Vipers is the Vedic name for the bees and Sutuddhi is the Vedic name for the Satlaj. Forth from the bosom of the mountains, eager as two swift mares with loosened rain contending. Like two bright mother cows who lick their youngling, Vipas and Suchudri speed down their waters. Impelled by Indra whom ye pray to urge you, ye move as twere on chariots to the ocean. Flowing together, swelling with your billows, O lucid streams, each of you seeks the other. As for the waters of the Yamuna flowing into the Ghaggar Hakra, if they did so, then the Rigveda wouldn't be mentioning the Yamuna as a separate river. The Yamuna would then be 
the Saraswati. That the Yamuna is listed as a river separate from the Saraswati is proof that if the Yamuna did steal the waters of the Saraswati to give it to the Ganga, it happened before the Rigveda was composed. Witzel quotes the surveys made by the Pakistani archaeologist Muhammad Rafiq Mughal which showed there were settlements on the Pakistani side of the Saraswati even as late as 1500 BCE, suggesting that the river was still flowing then, well after the decline of the Harappan. Civilization, too the inferences mentioned above were based on philological and archaeological evidence and a limited number of geological studies and, therefore, it would make sense to take stock of two extensive scientific studies undertaken recently. A 2012 paper titled, Fluvial Landscapes of the Harappan Civilization, and a 2017 paper titled, Counterintuitive Influence of Himalayan River Morphodynamics on Indus Civilization Urban Settlements. The first was co-authored by the geologists Liviu Geosin of the Woods Hole Geographic Oceanographic Institution, Massachusetts, Peter D. Clift of the University of Aberdeen, UK, the archaeobotanist Dorian Q. Fuller and others. The second was co-authored by the geologists Ajit Singh and Rajiv Singh of the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, Christina J. Thompson of the Center for Nuclear Technologies of the Technical University of Denmark and others. The first study looked at climatic and river flow changes during the Harappan civilization to understand probable causes for its decline, and came to two clear conclusions. First, a gradual decrease in flood intensity probably stimulated intensive agriculture initially and encouraged urbanization around 2500 BCE however, continued decline in monsoon precipitation adversely affected both flood-based and rain-based farming ultimately. The second conclusion was about Ghaggar Hakra. Contrary to earlier assumptions that a large glacier-fed Himalayan river, identified by some with the mythical Saraswati, watered the Harappan heartland on the interfluve between the Indus and Ganges basins, we show that only monsoonal-fed rivers were active there during the Holocene. As the monsoon weakened, monsoonal rivers gradually dried or became seasonal, affecting habitability along their courses. Hydroclimatic stress increased the vulnerability of agricultural production supporting Harappan urbanism, leading to settlement downsizing, diversification of crops, and a drastic increase in settlements in the moister monsoon regions of the Upper Punjab, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh. In other words, from about 10,000 BCE onward, Ghaggar Hakra has been a rain-fed river and, therefore, couldn't have been the mighty river that was powerful enough to break mountaintops like a snowmelt-fed river would be. The second study, by Ajit Singh and others, came to an equally strong conclusion. The Indus civilization settlements developed along an abandoned river valley, not an active Himalayan one, it states. Using optically stimulated luminescence dating of sand grains, we demonstrate that flow of the Satluj in this course terminated considerably earlier than Indus occupation, with diversion to its present course complete shortly after around 8,000 years ago. Indus urban settlements thus developed along an abandoned river valley rather than an active Himalayan river. We suggest that this abandoned and sized valley was an ideal site for urban development because of its relative stability compared to Himalayan river channel belts that regularly experience devastating floods and lateral channel migration. Even after the diversion of the Satluj, says the study, ephemeral monsoon fed rivers deriving from the Himalayan foothills, much like the modern Deghaggar, continued to flow in the relict valley, thus helping sustain the Indus urban settlements. The study noted sedimentation in the valley decreasing after 3000 BCE, probably due to reducing monsoon intensity. In conclusion, says the study, our results firmly rule out the existence of a Himalayan-fed river that nourished Indus civilization settlements along. The Ghaggar Hakra Paleo Channel, instead, the relaxed Satluj Valley acted to focus monsoon-fed seasonal river flow as evidenced by very fine-grained sediments in the upper part of the valley fill record. On the question whether it was the weakening of the Indian summer monsoon that led to the decline of the civilization, the 2017 study is non-committal unlike the 2012 one. It states, while independent climate records provide strong evidence for widespread weakening of the Indian summer monsoon across large parts of India 4,200 to 4,000 years ago, 
and a cause indicator marked decrease in sedimentation rate after 5,000 years ago. Current fluvial chronologies lack the resolution necessary to draw robust conclusions. However, the 2012 study's findings that a long-term weakening of the monsoon as what caused the drying up of the Ghaggar Hakra got a big thumbs up in July 2018 when the International Commission on Stratigraphy ICS, the official keeper of geologic time, introduced a new age called the Meghalayan, which runs from 2200 BCE to the present. This is significant because according to the ICS, the Meghalayan age began with a mega drought that crushed a number of civilizations worldwide in Egypt, Mesopotamia, China and, of course, India. The mega drought was likely triggered by shifts in ocean and atmospheric circulation. For the ICS to approve a classification of this kind, there has to be clear and unambiguous evidence of a shift of some kind that is global in extent. In the case of the Meghalayan, the evidence is a perturbation in the isotopes of oxygen atoms present in the layers of a stalagmite growing from the floor of the Momlu cave in Meghalay. Professor Mike Walker of the University of Wales, UK, who led the international team of Holocene scientists responsible for developing the proposal for a new age, told a news agency that the isotopic shift reflects a 20 to 30 percent decrease in monsoon rainfall. The overwhelming evidence today, therefore, is that what shrunk the Ghaggar Hakra was not a tectonic event that stole its waters and gave it to the Ganga or the Indus, but a mega drought that had global impact. To reiterate, the Ghaggar was a monsoon-fed river that was weakened by monsoon failure, and not a mighty, snowmelt-fed river that was used to breaking mountain tops, as migration denialists insist. Thanks for listen audiobooks The Early Indians written by Tony Joseph. This is end of this book, a like share and subscribe our channel for more books. You can suggest if you like to hear to audiobooks you want. Thank you. And coming soon with new next books.